Wonderful. Good evening, Patty. We're, tonight we're meeting with Patty Johnson, and Patty is wears a number of hats. You know, critic, uh, founder of Art F City. How how did you? This is what, you know, one of the things that surprises me frequently with guests that we talk to who are not per se artists is that when they were kids, they aspired to be artists. Is that something that you thought about when you were young? Oh, it's more than even when I was young. I mean, I my parents have like, you know, pictures that I drew when I was a kid, but I have like a whole kind of trajectory of like, you know, being interested primarily in representation. And then, you know, I have a, a Bachelor of Fine Art and an MFA in Fine Art. So I'm actually, I spent a fair amount of time in school doing, you know, making art before I did this. And you were also, this is interesting. Well, I'll come back. You're Canadian. Yes, that's correct. And Canadians have a reputation for being intensely polite, at least in my book. <laughs> well, you know, R.M. Vaughn, who's the, uh, who was, I think, the uh, critic for the Globe and Mail, just uh, uh, released a book called Compared to Hitler. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't think that that uh, that kind of politeness runs through the art critics in Canada. So, how did you turn from from a, a maker of visual images to a wordsmith? Well, you know, I I, I think a lot of the sensibility of, of making was in me when I started the blog, um, because you know a lot of the things that you have to do as an artist, you have to be sort of inventive with materials. You have to teach yourself a lot. Like I had to do all those things online. Like I didn't know any HTML. I had to teach myself how to write. Like, and um, you know, I started the blog as a means of kind of inserting myself into the uh, fine art world. And so the best way that I could. You know, at the time, I had a studio practice, and I don't think it was going particularly well. And I was also doing, you know, I had a lot of gallery jobs, and they were all terrible. And I got fired from, like, absolutely every one of them. And after about five years in the city, you know, when you go to a gallery and they say, well, you know, why'd you leave this job? And you've got, like, a trail of five or six jobs that you've been fired from, like, the explanation. You know, like, oh, I wanted to leave to do this or that seems a little less credible. Um, but one of the things that did happen, um, you know, I, I was very good at getting these jobs that I wasn't particularly good at because um, I was very good at writing cover letters. And that um, kind of skill, as it turns out, is sort of very similar to that um, of like writing a blog where you have to really make yourself out to be like the most qualified expert on something that you may have like no idea what it was before you started writing about it. So there, there actually was, I like to think anyway, some, you know, a lot of what I was doing prior to that time, um, you know, feeds into um, what I do now. I'm curious about why you call Art F City a blog, because I think it's outgrown what we construe a blog to be. Um, go ahead. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, more than anything else, it's just the vertical format, which I think is very bloggy. I mean, okay. we try to do things that um, sort of go beyond the blog um, in terms of format, and and that's something that's, like, relatively new for us. So, you know, for example, we just um, organized a panel on affordable housing in New York uh, with, uh, well, the affordable workspace, really, um, with Gauhegan and ASAP, the Artist Studio Affordability Project, and that it aligns um, I think more with some of the public programming that we'd like to build into, um, you know, what we do. Okay. But I consider you an online magazine. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. But I just, like, I think the vertical format makes us a blog. And, I'm, I, you know, I'm happy to be 
called a magazine. Um, you know, but I don't think that the um, that the blog has a kind of breadth that say that New York Magazine has online. Okay, where were you before? I want this is tangential. Where were you before you moved to New York? Uh, well, I was at Rutgers University um, doing my MFA there, and then That's <laughs> yeah, no, it was very close. So was there a conscious decision to move to New York, or was it automatic because you were at Rutgers, which is less than an hour away? No, I mean, it was absolutely a conscious decision. I went to Rutgers with the hope that afterwards I would move to New York. It was basically the reason I went there. I mean, that, and it's a, it was a cheap day school. Um, and so when I moved, I moved with a bunch of my classmates, and I still live in the same loft. How long has that been? Uh, I moved in 2001, so that's, I don't know. Something for a dozen years yeah. anyway. Um, and when did you start art? Well, it was initially Art Fact City, and what? You had to change it for political reasons. I don't know if it, I, I mean, I suppose it's political reasons. I mean, basically, we just had to change it because, um, you know, with the professionalization of the web, there were just too many things that we couldn't do with the name. You know, we couldn't have a Facebook page. We couldn't launch successful email mailers. Like, we couldn't get certain kinds of brands. And, you know, at the end of the day, you, like, you ask yourself, do I want to eat a hamburger? Do I want my writers to be able to eat a hamburger? Do we really want to grow the blog, um, you know, more significantly than it is? And when that answer is yes, you don't really have that many options. What was the genesis of the name in the first place? Um, I used it in the same way someone might use the Opera Queen. So art art bag is is the same as saying art van. And to me it just seemed like that city was really, you know, at the time the uh, epicenter of uh, where I wanted to be and where I you know, the community that I identified with was. I think of you as one of the more intelligent and and outspoken art critics, art comment commenters. Um, and I think many people are reluctant to be outspoken or it has a facet of disingenuousness. You don't. You come across very sincerely and you address conscientious issues that I think others are frequently afraid to touch. Um, is is that a strategy? Is it a, is it is it a vision? Is it do you moderate it ever? Do you um, or do you just go for it? You know, I mean, like I don't know. Find my question in there and respond. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I uh, first of all, thank you. Um, you know, it is something that I aspire to. I aspire. I you know, when I write things, I want people like I want them to come from an honest place. And that's like, you know, I think one of the objectives of the blog is to make sure that there is a sort of an element of, of honesty. Um, I would say that I, um, I mean, in terms of an objective that, that the blog has, I mean, we don't publish that much by way of gossip, you know, if, you know, such and such a gallery owner is having an affair, like, that's something we'll pass on and have passed on. I think, you know, for us, the sort of moral compass that we use is, like, you know, does does this benefit, you know, a greater community? And when the answer is yes, then that's when we'll, you know, we'll, we'll explore that more. And, I mean, I feel like, you know, I I have 13 years in New York. I have, you know, nine years running the blog. And, like, I definitely have a stake in the art world. And I feel like, you know, it's really important if you feel, like, if you believe in something, to try and make make that, like, stake those claims out. Because you want to live in the art and work in the art world, you'd like to see. Okay. Um, I forgot where I was going to go. 
do how much more can you grow this? How, what are your aspirations? Where would you like to be in five years? You know, I think that's a good question. I mean, I would say that this, you know, right now AFC is sort of in, in between. We're in, we're somewhere between a nonprofit and a for profit, and we're verging towards the nonprofit model. So within the next year, we'll be there. And the current, you know, operating budget for Art of City is around 70k. For a blog that employs three to four people at any given time, that is a very small amount. It's a very small operating budget. So yeah, we, I think aim, so. yeah. So I mean, I think like just fiscally, I can say that we aim to be at the 200,000 mark by year 2015. Um, and, you know, we think we can do that through a combination of grants, grant applications for the program that we have, which is just the blog, it's in the online magazine, um, and uh, through fundraising and through building our board and through, um, you know, a certain amount of advertising. And so, you know, I think our main problem, you know, it's not – it's not like there's a dearth of things to cover. Like, our main problem is that we can't really cover as much as we want to. You know, I'm the only full-time person on staff. You know, I used to write all the time, but I can't write every day now if I, you know, because I'll have to fundraise or, you know, organize um, different projects that go on in the blog. So. You know, I I think that uh, you know over the next couple of years, you've like a sort of a, I don't know what you would call it. Like we're really focused on capacity building. You the uh, grant world language. Are you a not for profit now? Um, like I said, we're somewhere in between. So we have a non profit. We have non profit status, but we don't have the five hundred one c three. And we're fiscally sponsored. So okay, so that's how you get grants through the fiscal agent. Um, yes, we can, but those are limited. So we're, for example, we've received uh, grants from the Brooklyn Arts uh, Council and um, also from the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Um, and you write for other entities? Uh, I do. I have a column at ArtNet right now. Right. Um, and uh, that that just gives me a little bit like larger um, platform um, to you know get my voice out. I feel like you are. Well, I would probably go three or four of top art voices critics in the United States. Um, you know, so maybe we could say you're in the top five, and even if we go top ten. That's significant. What happens if you get – what if you get co-opted? What if the New York Times says, we'd like you to write for us weekly, but you got to drop this other stuff? I mean, I think I would have to really think about that. I, to be honest, you know, nobody's ever approached me and said, you know, wouldn't it be nice for you to drop AFC and just work for us? Um you know, on your own. And, um, you know, if the times came to me right now, I would probably turn them down. Um, and that's because the blog doesn't really, at this point, function without me. You know, it, if I were to leave, like, it would be difficult for the blog to just get another executive director. Um, you know, two years from now, if the New York Times were to approach me and, you know, I felt like the organization was really stable enough that somebody could replace me and that voice would remain and that the, um, you know, I think some of the social activism that I think is very important to AFC could be maintained and maybe I would think about it. Um, you know, but for me, I think, like, some of the, like, more socially engaged work that we do is really important, and that's difficult to do at the time um, because they do look for a very clear separation between 
you know, uh, um, between who you're reporting on and who you're working with. And I, you know, I have an interest in, say, Occupy Wall Street, and I would probably want to write about it too. Right. Um, do you feel like your Canadianness gives you an overview or a perspective of the United States and what goes on here in art as opposed to, the, you know, in Canada or totally submersed in American shenanigans? <laughs> do you mean? Um, do you mean, do I feel like sort of disconnected in some way to, um, yeah. or detached? No. I mean, or do you um, have a, do you have a detached perspective? You know, not, not that you're detached because you're immersed, but do you have a perspective as an outsider that gives you an objectivity or, uh, you know, or greater wisdom about looking on, what, uh, looking at what's going on here? I mean, I think, like, Republicans are crazy. Um, I'm not sure that that's, like, a, a perspective that it comes from me being, like, Canadian. Um, I, I, You know, the thing is, is that I've been here, like, so, you know, 13 years plus, so 15 years I've been in the United States. You know, at this point, like, I am, um, you know, I follow, like, American news more closely than I do Canadian. Um, you know, I think that the biggest thing that being Canadian does is that, like, my sense of American geography is terrible. And, like, you know, my understanding of, uh, like, various Senate rules, I feel like I'm always you know, doing catch up on that stuff. But I, I don't think that I'm, you know, I have any additional wisdom because I, you know, I can sort of bring a detached um, eye to the New York, like, art world, the new, like, the um, sort of American politics. It's, it's, at this point, it's just not that detached. When you write about a show like The Written by Any, do you look at what others have written before you and say, nope, I'm not going to say this, it's already been covered? Um, or do you say, I really want to address a given perspective? Do you say, ooh, I shouldn't say that, I might piss too many people off? Do you say, I shouldn't say that, I might not piss enough people off? Um, what's the thought process before you take on something meaty like the biennial? Well, the biennial is interesting because there's always things to say about the biennial. Um, because, like, it's supposed to be a statement on the last two years. So, yep. I, you know, um, I've never written a review of the biennial and not staked out a claim. Um, just because... I, I don't know. It might just be my personality. Like, I've just never not had an opinion on it. The things that I won't write about are things that, you know, I don't care about or have, you know, any interest in. Because, like, you know, for me, I think a lot of, like, the more the most interesting thing about writing a review is that, like, it always feels like solving a puzzle. You know, you're, you sort of, and and I don't know, like, I, I feel like a lot of critics, like, you know, when they start, they pretty much know what they're going to say, and they just have to write it out. For me, yeah. you know, sometimes the review will take me three or four days because I didn't know what I was going to say, and I will have changed my mind three or four times in the writing process before I figured out, like, before it's sort of a Rubik's Cube that I feel like I've solved. So, it may sort of appear like there's this one fluid argument that, you know, could, and there could be no other, but like, basically that's because I've sort of argued maybe three or four positions, you know, written myself into a corner, realized that that was not correct for me, and then, you know, changed my position. So my, that, 
that's fairly reflective of my writing process. Do you consciously look for something that hasn't been said? No, I mean, I, I read everybody's stuff. I don't think that that's like, um, I don't think that that's that helpful, actually. Like, you know, I, I think in, my, in the Whitney Biennial Review of 2012 that I wrote, I think I, oh, no, was it 2012 or, yeah, 2012, I referenced Howard Halley's review because I thought it was really good and worth, you know, worth mentioning. I mean, quite honestly, I thought his review was better than the one I did. Not that mine was bad. I thought it was, I mean, it wasn't very nice to the biennial, but, like, you know, he did a really good job of breaking down those points. And when somebody does that, you just have to credit them. And and I think that's like uh, that's just part of the profession. How do you feel? People tend to have strong responses to what you write, not always positive. How does that feel? Um, I think I'm kind of known for being defensive about things, and I'm trying to. I'm I'm actually trying to get better about that because. Wait, 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 wait. Um, pronouns. You're trying to get better at what? Uh, and trying to get better at not being so defensive when people say, you know, okay. hey, you got that totally wrong and yours is awful and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, because I think for me, the point is to try and learn. And when you're being really defensive, it's difficult. Um, but, you know, when you put something out there, like, obviously, you, like, you want it to be, like, exactly right in, in the way that you you put things and you know when somebody pokes a few holes in your theory that that can be really difficult yeah well yeah i mean i write also and i'm now you know i'm much more of a cheerleader than i am a critic um and you know when, when somebody points out something that somehow they construed something differently than i intended or they see see something like oh whoa that's good i missed that one um you know it's the Humbling. Yeah, yeah. I feel like Art F City is an advocate for young and emerging artists. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. It's you know we make a point of um, you know writing about emerging and young artists all the time in the blog. Um, you know, also you know even just in our links, like every morning you look at the link, there you know we cite major major sites, but we try to keep those links to a minimum. You know, our you know, I think the links are, are better when they're not filled with links that everybody's reading anyway. So, you know, even within like sort of simple things, we you know, we try to make sure that the little guy has a voice. How much of that is an extent an extension of your liking given artists and how much of it is that they're getting attention and you want to augment that. I mean, what are the considerations that go into what you what, what gets included? You know, it's funny because I was thinking the other day whether it was harder to talk about emerging artists now than it was when I was 30 and I started the blog because, like, you know, when I was 30, everybody was young and, you know, all my friends anyway were young. And that was like, and when I met somebody new, maybe they'd be younger than me, but like they were all in the emerging artist camp. And now I'm in a position where like some of my, you know, a lot of my, like I'm not that young anymore. Um, and I I'm, can't claim to be particularly happy about that, but like, um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, I'm not like, you know, I'm not super young anymore, and that means, but, like, I still, I'm still covering that scene. So, it's, you know, I think I have, like, a certain amount of anxiety that I'll, like, stop meeting young people, but I never do. And we also try, you know, it's not just emerging art artists. It's artists who, for whatever reason, have not, deserve the attention, gotten the attention that we think they deserve. So that is a particular problem 
for people who are, you know, actually now of my generation and older, but it haven't right. had a lot of commercial gallery success, but whose practices are total, you know, they're really successful and great, and there's no reason that they shouldn't, you know, have a platform except that the market has, you know, the commercial market anyway has a bias towards, you know, younger artists. I think Edward Winkleman said, with maybe, I think I, he said it in January that, like, um, you know, most artists, you can only accept, like, expect them to have, like, to be profitable for a gallery um, for about four to six years, which is to say maybe the long term, you know, expect, the expectation that a gallery will be with you in the long term is, is um, you know, not fair to the gallery. And, uh, you know, I think I don't have any say over those type, types of things. Um, right. You know, a collector is going to buy what they're going to buy. And, you know, as far as I can tell, like, you know, we have some, some small sway in that. But, like, you know, collectors just do what they do. Um, but, like, you know, that's not a very good position to be in for an artist who's, like, had a gallery for a couple of years, maybe the gallery goes under, maybe, like, you know, something happens, and all of a sudden, you know, somebody has decided they're not profitable. Oh, so, you know, you, you know, you, I don't know what to do about that except to try and talk about them when you can. What kinds of things get included when you want to, you know, I mean, for an emerging artist? Does it usually revolve around a gallery exhibition in New York, or are there other criteria that, you know, would you write about something that's not in New York? Would you write about an artist who's not having an exhibit? What are the issues? Um, well, for the blog, it's difficult for us to write about a, an artist who's not having an exhibit because blog is time-based. So, you know, and the art world does sort of increasingly respond to event-based things. So we tend not to write about artists that are not in um, shows currently. Um, we make exceptions. Um, we're able or are able to write about artists uh, who make work online because um, we have like GIF of the day, which is right. something where we just choose a GIF and that's the thing at the end. And we're just working something into this where like every three weeks we turn around and we, you know, we take a look at the GIFs we posted and try to do some, you know, give some critical feedback. Um, but, uh, you know, we do travel. Um, we're actually just making plans now to go to North Carolina um, so that we can see some work at the MFA show at the, at the Witherspoon um, and, you know, just sort of see what what people are making making there. We're, we're also going to connect to Elsewhere, um, which is an artist project based in, in North Carolina that we're very interested in. So we do travel. We're not just stuck to New York. We do travel. Um, and without, without insulting North Carolina, why North Carolina and not Missouri? <laughs> uh, you know, in this case, it just happens to be that we know some people there. So, you know. So this is an extension of personal so relationships. Absolutely. And that's, um, you know. A lot of times when I travel, and I travel several times a year, it's usually because, you know, a university or a museum has reached out to me and they want me to do a talk, which I will then do and then try to sort of fold in, like, some kind of coverage. Um, so I went to Denver to see their, uh, the, um, the uh, biennials that they had there. Um, Biennial of the Americas, I think, um, which I reviewed. Um, and this year, I mean, we're actually we're 
working to make this like an active part of our program. So like choosing four places a year. Okay. So there are, there are more emerging artists worthy of coverage than you can cover. Fair yeah, enough? Absolutely. How do you choose? You know, sometimes, I mean, I have a particular aesthetic that I that I tend to respond to. Um, you know, I like assemblage stuff. I tend to like stuff that has some kind of, like, sexual undertone to it. Um, I tend to like work that has some kind of political commentary to it that seems to be saying something. So when I choose work, to write about, it's usually because I think first and foremost, it's it appears to have a message of some sort, and that can be purely formal, but it's you know um, often I think it goes beyond that. Um, you know, as for what the you know the other writers on the blog respond to, you know I. It's all individual taste, but that, you know, that tends to be, you know, the things that uh, I respond to. And, of course, like I have to say, there is an element of personal connection. So, for example, about, I think it was about the 2010, so four years ago, RF City posted uh, a show called uh, Pussy Faggot. And these kids from this gallery called Reference went up, uh, came up to see the show. And when we hosted the show, we were just a sponsor for a Ryan Tricardin screening. They came, they met us. I had no idea who they were. It turns out they had some sort of Tumblr following. You know, they were interesting and interested. So I looked them up. For the next couple of years, I, you know, every time they came up to New York, I would connect with them. You know, maybe I'd go see art with them or just, you know, get a coffee, whatever it was. At the same time, they were meeting a lot of other people. So they, um, and this one kid, Connor Backman, we featured him in our masthead. He was doing these, like, sort of real, like, Trump Floyd. Pictures of uh, um, beer cases, and so we picked, we we featured him on the masthead, and you know I think it, it might have been a little early in his career to feature him, but that's sort of fine. Like in our world, that's like you know sometimes that's okay. Um, and then he got a show. Uh, with Joshua Avalo, he was curated into a show at, in Ross Fletcher's studio. Then he was shown um, in uh, Baltimore. Um, I can't remember the name of the gallery. Um, and he was shown at Mixed Green in New York. And he's had, now I think he's represented by Mixed Green in New York. So, like, in that, like, this is a case of an artist who I've sort of, I've tracked the career, and the reason I've tracked the career was, you know, one part, I was very interested in the work, but two, you know, they, him and his friends really made an effort to, like, reach out to me, and because they were interesting and engaged, I made an effort to reach back to them. You know, I, I, we talk a lot in this course about how that happens frequently, and my sense is that, you know, and what I encourage people is that it's more about relationships often than anything else. And that to be, you know, a genuine person and contribute to others and seek to grow one's community as opposed to just, you know, the crassness of what I consider networking to be, you know, pays off. And that you, you want to be, you know, I don't know. It, it's an ex I heard somebody say that the intent of being a human is to be a, a, a good ancestor. You know, and somehow the attitude that that conveys, you know, is sort of, I mean, how one should be in a relationship. Seek to give a little more, you know, to invest in your own karma. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So does this get to the point of advocacy ever on your part? Um, yes. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I guess I'm just wondering to what extent, like, um, 
I think there are certain artists who definitely get more um, coverage on the blog than others. And a lot of times that does have to do with uh, personal relationships. It's not, but, you know, I guess I would be careful when I say that because, um, you know, anybody who is a personal friend, we always make a note of that on the blog. So you never, like, you'll, like, if we have a listing with a particular person, um, exhibition and we know them and we're, we would consider them friends, we say, you know, so and so, an art of city friend. Right. Um, I mean, when I noticed that the curator or, you know, a, 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 a university director was sitting on the jury for Artadia Awards and that juror had slept with all the winners, I thought that that was distasteful. <laughs> you know, I, uh, so that, yeah, I mean, it, it can go too far. I think it needs to maintain, you know, I mean, I think we're all human, but I think when we're, you know, paying favors for someone who's in our bed, um, we need to be more delicate. Yeah, I mean, I've heard about, uh, you know, a couple of occasions where that that has been the case. Um, I mean, I just think that's never a good thing. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, let's open this up for questions in a moment. Let me ask you another question. You guys have questions. And Patty, raise your hand, and I'll get you in a second. Um, here's a loaded question. Where does the power lie in the art world? Um, I think, here's what I think. I think it's distributed. I think it's a mistake to say that it lies in one, in one place. I think we all have power to a certain degree. Like I, and I think it's important that we own the power that we do have so that we maintain it. Um, but I also, you know, I think that within the blue chippy world, you know, there are people who are making a, you know, I think the larger galleries have more, um, are bringing in more money, and I guess that does count for a certain amount of power. Americans uh, keep score with money a lot. It's, you know, there, there are other, yeah. there, there are other ways of keeping score than just the money one. It's true, but it is the dominant one, particularly in the in the Chelsea art world. Um, so you know, collectors and and dealers have a lot of sway. But I think, you know, I think just as much like if you're an artist, if you're a curator, if you're a critic, you too have power, and it's important that you own that power. I agree. You know, but I, I know some frustrated people in the art world, and this isn't, they're not, not artists at the moment. I mean, they're not artists. And they talk about the gatekeepers. And I pretty much categorically feel that there are no gatekeepers. I mean, no, not really. I mean, I'm sorry. I was just sort of thinking about art fairs because they seem like the closest thing to an art a, a gatekeeper. Because you either, you know, if you're a gallery, you apply to get in, and either you do or you don't. But everybody wants to get into Art Basel or not us. And then it seems like everything else is sort of you settle for what you get. Um. So, in that sense, I think there is some gatekeeping. Um, yeah, maybe in terms of galleries and what they're after, but I don't think it's in terms of artists very much. I don't think very many artists are going to say, my work is in this, I can't get where I want because my, what I do is in disfavor, or I'm in disfavor, or they, they're they suppressing me. I don't yeah. see that it exists. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Sherry, let's see what Sherry has to say. Sherry, go ahead. Hi, Patty. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm in uh, Los Angeles where, you know, uh, affordable studio and live work space is just a big problem. So I was wondering if you could talk a little more about what you're, what you're doing for that, um, where you are. Um, well, you know, I think the problems tend to be uh, the way that you deal with them can vary greatly from city to city. So, for example, um, New York's greatest problem is that all of the sort of decision making that the city might have in terms of like you know, whether we get commercial rent protection, which would 
be a boon for the city or greater residential rent protection um, is all in the hands of Albany. And, um, you know, there's a Democratic when Patty says Albany, she means state government. Albany is the capital for those of you whose history, whose geography isn't as good as Patty's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you know, a lot of uh, what we've been talking about is uh, lobbying um, New York State uh, to give the city back some control. Uh, the other thing we have been talking about, I'm part of a collective called Placeholder um, that is looking to create a non-profit or a, a low-profit entity that would purchase a building um, specifically for, um, you know, for artist use and build, um, you know, a, that kind of restriction. The, that kind of restriction into the, the legal language of the purchase, which would um, permanently lower the value of the of the property, but make it ideal for student or not student uh, artist use. And so, you know, the idea would be to create something where that building uh, was a communal building that offered. Uh, market or below rock market uh, studio rent rental rates. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think that's maybe not as specific as uh as you might want for Well no, I mean, you know, for instance Minneapolis Saint Paul, they have tons of these old warehouses that they've and uh, you know, redone for artist lofts and spaces, and they subsidize artists there. I mean, I'm I'm a sub I'm subsidized if I'm there, and it's really nice. But I'm just wondering if other places need to do that. I mean, I wish they would. I think it's just really hard to subsidize. Um, you know, when the land value is so high, it becomes really difficult to subsidize artists. I mean, we're talking yeah, sure. about build. You know, buying a building and. You know what that means is that we have to fundraise at least ten million dollars. So, like, just you know, to even purchase the building before, like, you know, renovations and things like that. And you know, the end goal is to make this a you know a, a artist land trust. But um, you know, it's it's difficult. Um, we had this uh, this guy on the, the panel that I hosted um, on Thursday named Tom Ignati, and he has on his website, and we'll be publishing this tomorrow so you can find it there, but he has a list of five things that you can do um, to be more, like, to get what you want. Um, and part of that is just like, talking to your neighbors, finding out what they want, like being involved in the community, get involved in a community board. These are the kinds of things that really give you agency, so you have some control over the direction that, the, you know, your neighborhood that you're invested in already goes. Right. Okay, thank you. You know, I'm hearing more, Patty, about artists leaving New York and that the, the, the rents and the cost of living is too high and that there's, I mean, I, I feel like the art mark world has, I don't know, a, a portion of it has been centralized around New York and that that is becoming past tense. What do you think? Uh, well, it's not past tense for the market. If you look at where all the large galleries are, like the, the largest galleries, rather like you know, Bogosian has four, maybe five galleries in New York right now with their with the new one on Park Avenue and the pop up in uh in the Lower East Side. David Warner has two galleries. Hauser and Worth has two galleries and massive. That's all in New York. Does that dictate that the artist, all artists should go to live in New York? Or is it, as, no, is it as true that artists should focus on New York as it was? It, absolutely not. But what I, I guess what I'm just, uh, sort of disputing here is the idea that, like, the art center is no longer New York. 
It depends what center you're talking about, I'm right? Not certainly the center, or it's certainly the capital, or it's certainly, you know, the, the so, big bump on the hill. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, but, like, from a market perspective and from a mu museum perspective, I think New York is the center. Does that mean that it's a hospitable, hospitable place for artists? I think, you know, what you're talking about is very real. A lot of people I know are moving. I have to fight to keep my, you know, my staff around, you know, because, like, it's really hard for them to get by. And it's really hard for, like, everybody I know is getting priced out. So, yeah, people are moving. People who live here a really long time are, you know, just throwing in the towel and saying, you know what, I'd rather just live somewhere where it's, like, easier to get by. And I don't blame anybody for moving. Like, if you've been here, like, especially if you've been here 14 years, like, just because you move away doesn't mean that, like, your network disappears. <laughs> totally true. Bob, you wanted to say something. Go ahead, Bob. And when I look at, at RF City, um, I see a lot of, you know, sort of short blurb things. It's... Uh, the image of of the from the show and a and a line or two and you know where it is and and uh, but it, is there a part that's focused more that goes deeper into into what I might call criticism you know actually talking about the work deep more deeply or is that yeah I mean if you look um, last week we published uh, is uh, this is a review that I wrote is Jordan Wilson's uh, art meaningless um, that was nine hundred words. Um, if you look at is it just sort of, I just I just scan through and and pick out the longer form pieces or is there a special section for the longer form pieces? There's no special section for the longer form pieces. What you're looking at on the front page of the blog are excerpts. So some of them are long if you flip through, and some of them are not. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's no way of the like telling people how long an article is going to be once they click through, okay. um, you know, short of of saying, like, long form. But anything that has the tag review on it tells you that it's going to be longer than two sentences. So if you look for that tag and you click that tag, all the reviews that we write will come up and you'll be able to read them. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Hey, we've got space for more questions if people have them. I'm encouraging you to raise your hand. Um, what was your thought about the Whitney Biennial, Patty? Um, you know, honestly, I was not very thrilled with it. Um, you know, for the last, I, I think it's really been a while since I've seen a Whitney Biennial. I, um, have you ever? The, uh, yeah, I really, really liked um who was the, uh, um, starts with a B, the curator who, um, Bonami. Francesco? Francesco Bonami. I yep. thought that was a fantastic biennial. He really? Of, Sorry? He caught a lot of flack for that. I mean, everybody does. I mean, you know, you're inviting, you're inviting people to throw mud at you if you curate a biennial. Yeah, but I mean, I think everybody was wrong about that. I mean, I guess <laughs> no. Howard Halley had that one right. I think Howard Halley, I, I really think he's like the the best biennial critic there is. And, you know, he's been on it for years and almost without fail. I, you know, I sometimes don't agree with his picks for like who's good and who's not, but like sort of the overall impression of the, of the biennials, I think he's done a really good job on. But Francesco Bonami, I think, like gave a very clear look of you know, sort of an American landscape from an outsider's perspective. It was very, like, sort of respected, respectful of the viewers so that things were organized in a way that, like, they were sort of grouped if they were going to take a longer time. You were in a section. It was, like, the longer time section. And you knew, like, what the expectation of you was you know, as a viewer, and that to me makes an enormous difference, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, of the quality of a biennial. And I actually think, like, 
He got more flack for the Venice Biennale than he did for the Whitney Biennale. Totally right. Totally right. But I think the, the, the criticism for the Whitney was that he phoned it in, that he asked other people who he should include, and he took their opinion, and he didn't do his homework thoroughly. But that doesn't mean that the results are good or bad. I, I, you know, I just don't agree with that because I think there was so much that was good in that in that I show, know. like the Sharon Hayes, the Bruce High Quality Foundation. There was just a lot there to really think about too on. So I was very happy with that biennial. Um, this particular biennial, I just, you know, to me, it really seemed like each curator tried to put too much stuff. In that's that's a, of a lot of dealers, curators, etc. Too overcrowding. Yeah, and you you know, like if you look at this, like um, the Benami um, Biennial, I think had like maybe it was 68, 70 artists. It was not a huge biennial, and I thought, you know, it was really cohesive as a result. This had over a hundred artists. It's too many. You know, I like my, you know, what I would ask, you know, Whitney Biennial curators to think about more is, you know, the viewer. Like, I just feel like people get really excited about what they're doing and who they want to include and kind of lose track of, like, how much a viewer can really, you know, absorb. Quite true. So... Cool. So okay. yeah, I, I thought that this. I think I would have been happier if it was the if it was the uh, vision of one curator rather than three. Although I was happy to see two curators invited from the outside. Right. Media, right. Because I think that that kind of perspective is really important. No, I think that's a plus. I agree with that, Monica. Um. Go ahead, Monica. Patty, thanks for for being here. I I have a question. Just you mentioned Can you know, turn the your Chelsea camera, Art Monica? World. Pardon you, me. If you can, if you could turn your camera on, I'd like it. If you can't, that's okay. Oh no, I can. I didn't know it was off all this time. Me neither. Yeah, I just didn't hit hit the camera. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you. Um, just just quickly, you mentioned the Chelsea Art World. I'm very curious about, you know, there are a couple of nonprofit 501c3s in the Chelsea area. More of them are in Dumbo. What do you see as the difference between Dumbo and Chelsea and the survivability, I guess, of more alternative spaces in Chelsea? You know, honestly, I, as far as I can tell, the people that have um, – you know, spaces in the, the nonprofits that have spaces in Chelsea just have had long leases that have allowed them to stay there. Um, so we, I mean, I don't know how long Aperture is going to survive. Um, EAI is still there. Um, and IBEAM is leaving. And outside of that, I think most of the nonprofits have left. Mm -hmm. um, well, 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 one of the reasons I ask is that I'm a member of Soho 20, which is struggling to stay, but our lease is up in September, and, you know, it has a lot of difficulties and a lot of problems. But AIR moved quite a while ago to Dumbo, and, you know, it's a question now what, what we do next. Well, it's true. I mean, um, I'd forgotten about Soho 20. I mean, they have a problem in that they're, like, they're, that building is, I mean, I almost never go in that building, to be honest with you. Absolutely. I used, what? I used to go in there a little bit more, but um, I go there a lot less now. Um, the Cola Griffin's gone. Griffin's gone now. Yeah, there's a lot mm -hmm. of – so, um, but, I mean, I think you got to be careful about Dumbo, too, because it, it's really just turned into a dot-com – Mm -hmm. um, you know, Haven, and uh, most of the artists I know have moved away from Dumbo. I actually know artists who have moved out of Dumbo in Brooklyn to Tribeca in Manhattan because studio rates are cheaper there. Right. Um, you know, which is not to say that Tribeca has cheap 
studio rent, mm-hmm. but rather that it really comes to the sofa and that a lot of the tech industry is pushing people out there as well. So yeah. it does but seem there is like... there's talk about the Lower East Side and... Yeah, it just seems like there's some other galleries uh, artist-run spaces that are, yeah, staying in Manhattan. But, yeah. The it's Lower East Side right. is really expensive now, too. I mean, people are talking about that. It's like, I think Canada got a 10-year, or a 10 or 12-year net lease, so they'll be there for a while. But a couple of people have managed to get these really long leases, but... Mm-hmm. You know, it's definitely, um, you're, if you want cheap rent, you've got to go pretty far out now. Yeah. Thank you. you know, Anna. Okay, All right, maybe Bert gets the last question. Hi, Bert. You can go ahead. And it, I, it may be a naive question, but I'm just curious about the vanity galleries as a critic. Would you ever, um, do you ever go there? Obviously, you go to nonprofit um, and alternative spaces. But as a critic, what I guess, what is your take on the vanity galleries? Uh, I never go to them. Okay. That's and I and I wouldn't. You know, I I think it's. There's just so many other ways to get a show other than using a vanity gallery. Like, you know, you can join a member gallery like Solo 20 or like AIR Gallery or Vox Populi in Philadelphia. Like, there's so many. Like, you know, you can do an apartment show. You know, you really just need to have one or two friends to get an exhibition. And... I go to a lot of those exhibitions. You know, we do review apartment shows. Um, you know, we do make an effort to go out to some of those small shows. So, mm-hmm. um, but what we don't do is go to vanity galleries. Okay. It's amazing those galleries still exist. It's, you know, I mean, as I've commented here, everybody knows and they stay away in droves. I mean, it seems to me the only way they exist is by taking advantage of artists. And that's kind of offensive. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's best just not to support them at all. Anybody else have a question? I think we've got it, everybody. And I think our hour is about up, so that's okay timing. Patty, I think this has been really cool. I appreciate your genuineness. I appreciate your sincerity. I appreciate your writing. I appreciate pithy. There's a word I haven't used in a while. Um, you know, I, I think you. I think you're making a contribution, and I appreciate you having the moxie to stand up, you know, and say it without, you know, some of the fanfare that some other critics we could look at who, you know, it seems often that it's about self-aggrandizement as opposed to you know, making solely intelligent comment or judgment on what's going on. I think you're doing a superb job, and I really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. Let me unmute everybody so that they can say thank you, too. Everybody who's unmuted. Patty, thanks a ton for being with us this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Patty, I will see you next week. Patty, thank you again.